So far, we've talked about the rational zeros theorem, the factor theorem, the remainder theorem, and there's a few other theorems that um, are not quite as important uh, to the study of polynomials that we haven't even gone into. Uh, and I really wanted to focus on the critical ones um, in terms of our course. Uh, the next one that I want to discuss is called the fundamental theorem of algebra. And basically this theorem is very, very critical because it actually leads to the complete factorization theorem and also proves the zero theorem in an alternative way. Um, and also leads to more theorems such as the conjugate zeros theorem uh, and the linear and quadratic factors theorem, um, which are ones that we have yet to talk about. Um, and you know, it's kind of in the next couple videos I wanted to get into those, what those mean and how we can um, understand what they imply. But let's just check it out. <clears throat> and I wanted to talk a little bit about it. So the fundamental theorem of algebra says that every non-constant polynomial with complex or real coefficients has at least one complex or real zero. So the um, usually if you look it up uh, in a textbook, it won't specify that it could be real. But basically, the, in this case, we're dealing with polynomials that could have really, really weird. It could be rational, could be irrational, could be complex. Basically, any polynomial under the sun using any type of number, doesn't even have to be integers, uh, what, it, what it says is that it must have at least one zero to it. It basically cannot have any zeros. And what remember what I said about how zeros mean x-intercepts? That only applies to real zeros. Uh, imaginary zeros or complex zeros, those actually are not x-intercepts because imaginary numbers do not show up on a real graph. Because when we do an x-y graph, we're only graphing the real numbers. Imaginary numbers don't show up. Well, technically, those numbers can be visualized in a three-dimensional plane. You can view, there, there's an alternative way of looking at polynomials to where you actually it actually has more zeros if you open the plane up but you know that's way more complicated than we're gonna get into in this class but basically what it's saying is every polynomial has at least one zero it doesn't necessarily have to be real but it has a complex zero to it uh, and this this theorem is vitally important to the other theorems uh, and we're kind of kind of talk about why that's true uh, and if you're wondering, well, a, a, a lot of times in this class when we look at theorems, like when we talk about the remainder theorem or the zeros theorem, I kind of explain, well, why is this true? We didn't necessarily do a formalized proof, but we tried to at least, you know, kind of, ex you know, examine why. Uh, and for a long time, mathematicians knew this was true, but they had a heck of a time formally proving it. And if you've ever, if you ever, you know, are interested in studying advanced level math, one important component is topology, uh, proving things in a very formalized way, developing rigorous definitions and using those definitions to progress through a mathematical proof. That's all, you know, way beyond the scope of this class. And, and essentially what, what I'm trying to say here is trying to prove this theorem is difficult. It took hundreds of years uh, and, you know, it's, it's way beyond the technicality of this course. But what we can do is we can still uh, try to understand what this is saying and also what this implies about the nature of polynomial functions in general. Um, and actually what's interesting is some of the early proofs uh, by Gauss and Cauchy, uh, these, these various mathematicians proved the fundamental theorem in um, various ways. And a lot of them, they had some mistakes. They weren't really mistakes, but they just didn't really fully prove it. They had some missing components. Um, and it, modern mathematicians have corrected them within the last 50 or 100 years or so. And sometimes this happens where um, earlier mathematicians have uncovered certain properties. They do their darndest to try to prove it. Uh, and, you know, the advancement of the field, ha we haven't quite ha gone far enough to really understand how to progress further. Uh, and in math, there's still a lot of unproven theorems uh, that exist. Uh, in you know, it basically math is an ever evolving, ever changing field. It just, you know, as we keep studying it and we keep growing and as time progresses, it just becomes, you know, way more complicated, way more advanced. And in order to really grasp uh, grasp it, we you know, we have to keep studying it. So that's, you know, one of the things that if you were to get a PhD in mathematics or a postdoc, you would really study these little components a lot further. Personally, I was never um, that interested in um, the really out there aspects of mathematics, uh, because 
it can become so abstract that it's hard to really see why it's useful. For me, I really like to know why is math useful? How do I understand it? How do I know? Uh, and, and, you know, how does it really transition towards how the real world is? Um, and not that I, I do enjoy the abstract nature of mathematics, um, but basically it just gets a little bit too tedious uh, and too out there for me. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of more along the applied side in, in what I'm interested in. Um, but anyways, without further ado, let's go back to the packet um, and discuss some of these new theorems. Uh, and um, oh, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, the fundamental theorem of algebra um, is just one theorem. Um, and fundamental theorems exist in a lot of other fields. Like when you take calculus, one of the really important things is called the fundamental theorem of calculus. Or if you ever have to take calc three, or sometimes it's called multivariate or multivariable calculus, uh, there's various fundamental theorems in those course. It's kind of like, it's not necessarily the only important thing, but it's kind of like one of the biggest ideas and it relates back to a lot of other components. Often it connects those uh, metaphorical dots uh, in the field. Um, and so it's not to be taken lightly, even though the fundamental theorems are often quite complicated and, and hard to really understand, like with uh, what we call Green's theorem and Stokes theorem in Calc 3, these uh, are notoriously uh, hard theorems to understand. Um, you know, anyways, I just, I'm, I, I'm not really, I don't really have a point here in what I'm talking about, but it, it's an important theorem and that's why we call it so fundamental. But kind of one, of one of the reasons why it was so important is when this was formally proved, it led to a lot of other conclusions, which at the time it was sort of like we, mathematicians weren't really sure if this was true or not. They thought it was, but it was never formally proved. Once it was proved, we know it's true. And what does it imply? So that's kind of what's more interesting to me. Uh, and the complete factorization theorem is a direct result of the fundamental theorem of algebra. And what it says is that each polynomial with degree n is greater than or equal to one um, oops, I don't have my, I had the wrong screen pane. Um, the complete factorization theorem says that each polynomial of degree n is greater than one can be factored in such a way. P of x is equal to a x minus c1, x minus c2, dot, 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 up to x minus cn, where a and all the c's are complex or real numbers. Um, and essentially reading between the lines here, what it's saying is that every single polynomial can be fully factored into the form a times x minus c, where c1, c2, up to cn are all the roots of those polynomial functions. Um, and so why does this have anything to do with the fundamental theorem? And just to recap, the fundamental theorem said that every polynomial has at least one zero. Well, if you think about this, if any polynomial function, if it has to have one zero, Let's just say we're imagining some horrible polynomial like x to the a plus 7x to 7th, you know, whatever, um, something like this. Really, really horrible, really, really long polynomial. Well, what the fundamental theorem proved is that this polynomial has to have at least one zero in it. And as we've been talking about, we could use synthetic division, or if you're wondering how do I factor out a complex zero from a polynomial, well, you can't use synthetic division for it. So but we're gonna talk about one, some of the ways that you can. But basically, whatever that root is, I could factor it out. It has to have at least one, therefore I could factor it out. And once I factor it out, there's gonna be some remaining polynomial, whatever it might be. But, so the key there is that since once I factor out the first root, uh, the first binomial from it, there's gonna be another, it's, it's gonna result in a, the quotient, again, because that would have to have been divisible, it's going to result in the quotient another polynomial where well this polynomial is a polynomial so by the fundamental theorem of algebra this polynomial also has to have a zero so you know and that i could call c2 the second zero so i could then factor that next one out and that would result in x to the six plus whatever might be remaining and well that is also a polynomial it has to have a zero by the fundamental theorem so you can see by the fundamental theorem every polynomial has a zero, meaning as I can continue to factor out zero from zero from zero from zero until I wind up with a completely factored polynomial where a is always the leading coefficient of the polynomial uh, and then the remaining is just x minus c1 through cn where each one of those c's are the roots of the polynomial. And you know, with some, with some polynomials they're complex, 
Uh, and that's, you know, why we call it the complete factorization theorem, because every polynomial can be fully factored. And, you know, when we, when we learn in algebra how certain polynomials, like say, for example, 4x squared minus 24x plus 37, if you try to factor this, you're going to get stuck because we would often call it prime, meaning it can't be factored. And what the complete factorization theorem states is technically there is no such thing as a prime number when we're dealing with the complex number system. Uh, so I'm like, this is still prime when we're talking about real numbers and you can't factor it, but let's just see how we could factor it with uh, complex numbers. And again, let's start with the quadratic formula because the quadratic formula um, can help me can help me find the zeros of any quadratic and it's it's a very important tool uh, for understanding the roots of polynomials but starting with the quadratic formula i would have the the solutions to this quadratic equation set to zero would be negative b plus or minus b squared um, i don't remember 24 squared off the top of my head it is 576 Let me redo this. 24 plus or minus the square root of b squared, 576, minus 4ac. So minus 4 times 4 times 37 would give me 592. And all of that would be divided by 2a, um, which is 8. Hey, doggo. Um, and okay, so now that we have talked way too much about complex numbers, uh, let's see how we simplify this. So this would give me 24 plus or minus the square root of, well, 596 minus 592, that should be negative 16. The square root of negative 16, uh, since it's negative, that would be imaginary, uh, and 16 would give me four. So I would have 24 plus or minus four i. Insert a joke about four i's here and then we could of course simplify this um, by division so 24 divided by 8 is 3 and 4 i over 8 is 1 half i but basically what I end up getting is um, that this polynomial has two roots uh, or two zeros um, they're complex but that's perfectly fine zero like we are allowed to have imaginary numbers there's no issue with this uh, again, assuming that we're allowed to work with complex numbers. And also, basically, these would give me my two C values. I would have C1 is equal to 3 plus 1 half I, and C2 would be 3 minus 1 half I. So I can't see that. There we go. And I've got the roots. But as we were discussing, sometimes roots uh, are easy, like 5 or negative 2. Sometimes they're weird or horrible. But what the complete factorization theorem says is that every polynomial can be completely factored using all of the roots, even if they're complex numbers. So all that being said, what I could conclude is that P of X could be factored as A, which is four times X minus C1. Well, C1 uh, was three plus one half I. So basically I would have X minus three. Uh, let me go ahead and write this in parentheses just for now. Usually I would skip the parentheses and then times x minus c2, which was three minus one half i. But basically, it's a way to factor the polynomial using complex number systems. Even though usually we'd say this is prime, what the complete factorization theorem implies is that there's no such thing. We can factor every single polynomial completely. It just takes weird numbers. Uh, and again, weird is probably not the right term, but you know what I mean. Um, and, you know, if I was to just distribute out the negative, this would just be x minus 3 minus 1 half i and x minus 3 plus 1 half i. And kind of like I said, when you're talking about the factor, it's always x minus e. It's always got the opposite sign to the root. And that's the thing that you got to remember when you're putting it in here. Notice it's actually three terms, which is a little different just because complex number has two components and the full the complete factorization of this number it looks really awkward if you're not used to it but this is the way that we factor the polynomials and if if like this is, seems strange and you're like how can, how does this all work or what does this actually do we could actually check to make sure that this factorization is proper 
uh, as we would normally do in algebra, right? So the only way to know if this works is to actually multiply it through. So let's go ahead and do that over here, just to make sure that all of this is not a bunch of crap and that it actually does indeed work. I'm not yanking your chain. But basically, uh, let me just copy down what I'm claiming is the factorization of my polynomial. And let's just check. So if we want to multiply this all out, let's, I'll, I'll save the four for the end. Uh, and basically I would need to fully foil all this stuff out. So it's gonna take, because uh, they're both three terms, it's gonna take a total of nine products to make sure I get it all. So I'm just gonna go in that order. But I'm gonna end up with x squared uh, minus three x plus one half i x. Then I'm gonna have minus three x um, plus nine minus three halves i. Then I'm gonna have minus one half i x. And it looks like I'm gonna need a little bit more room here. Um, then plus three halves i. Let me go ahead and draw a little line there. Uh, and then negative one half i times positive one half i would be one fourth. And it would be positive because i squared makes negative one. Um, and anyways, uh, that would be the full expansion of that if I actually multiply it through. So I'm not saying it's pretty, it's definitely ugly. But if I look at what happens, notice that uh, all of the imaginary terms cancel because these were conjugates. Kind of like I was saying a couple videos ago, when you're multiplying complex conjugates, there's always a cancellation of the imaginary term. So even though this factorization looks really, really horrible, it still will multiply back together to make a polynomial with completely real integer coefficients. Uh, and in this case, one half i x and negative one half i x cancel each other out. Negative three halves i plus three halves i cancel. And what I'm left with is four times x squared minus six x, combining like terms, and then nine plus one fourth would be 37 fourths. Just doing a little fraction math. Uh, and then if I multiply in the four, I would have four x squared plus minus 24 x plus 37. And hopefully that's the same thing. Uh, yeah, we started with exactly that. And so again, I'm confirming that this factorization works. It's very unusual. And if you ask 100 people how to factor this polynomial, probably every single one of them would tell you you can't or, you know, it's impossible. But again, the kind of the, the this is the final conclusion on our study of polynomials. Uh, and there's a couple other theorems I want to reference in the next video. There, every polynomial can be factored. It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be pretty, um, but it can be done.